referring to my son. Got it. Okay. I see a couple of things already in the chat. Okay. Not for me. Okay, perfect. So the agenda for today, I'm just going to briefly introduce myself and share a little bit about um, what it means to have an equity focused research agenda. And then we'll get into um, the manuscript that kind of prompted the invitation for this talk, where we'll talk about developing justice oriented teaching dispositions and practices, um, and thinking about how we can center theoretical perspectives in doing that. And then I have um, kind of a moment to stop and think and talk um, about what it might mean to, re to conduct research in this area, and then we'll open it up for Q&A. Um, it's perfectly fine to stop me along the way if that feels more comfortable to you, so feel free to do, that, do so. I just ask that if someone who's actually in the lecture hall could repeat what folks are saying in case I have trouble hearing. Okay, um, I'm a third generation teacher and you can see lots of my family members here. Um, I come from a family of teachers on both my mother and my father's side. Um, and based on that, I learned from a very early age that teaching is indeed a political act and that issues of equity and racial justice are inextricable from teaching and learning. My mom and my maternal aunts in particular always emphasize the important role that teachers play in children's lives and how important it is to be an advocate for all children, especially black children. Most of my aunts taught in segregated schools um, in Louisiana. And so um, they were primarily working with, with young black children. Um, two of my favorite aunts have taught collectively for about a hundred years in the same public school system. And so growing up in that kind of family empowers you. Even when my cultural practices, histories and epistemologies were not centered in the schools I attended in suburban Atlanta, they certainly were at home, at church, with family and in my local communities. And I write about this in some of my other work that I'll share with you all later. I carried those understandings with me as I was learning how to be a teacher in Los Angeles, California, when I was at the University of Southern California. Um, you can see here I was a lot thinner and way more tan over 20 years ago working in LA um, as both a teacher and a teacher educator. As such, my research is grounded in my experiences as a former classroom-based teacher and in my training as a learning scientist and, um, and in STEM teaching and learning at UC Berkeley. Yet I don't take any of that for granted or make assumptions about what other people are able to do. I wanna remind us that we're all making progress in this area and we have to hold each other accountable to do the work. And as such, I see part of our work as scholars, no matter what stage we're at in our careers, um, is to support teachers, especially pre-service teachers, like the beautiful folks you see in these pictures and understanding the, the complicated ideas related to pursuing equity and justice and how, that, how to bring that to bear in their teaching. We should also be supporting undergraduate and graduate students in learning how to engage equity focused work in the learning sciences and STEM education and other subfields within educational research. In my research, I focus on teacher learning processes and how we can seek justice as part of the STEM learning experiences that we facilitate for young people. This work builds upon a rich history of scholars in learning sciences and STEM education and teacher education. Having an equity focused research agenda is especially important in our current socio-political climate, and we must find ways to continue to, to do that work, even in the difficult times that we're living through like right now. So this week is banned book week. You all are probably aware. Um, I live and work in the supposed great state of Texas where we currently have an anti CRT law in place and where people in states like Florida and Oklahoma and elsewhere um, are continuously pushing back against equity focused work and scholars whose work seeks to disrupt systemic racism and the myriad effects of white supremacist ideologies in the US and beyond. Even though this work can be very risky and very difficult to do, I remind us that generations of teachers and researchers have been doing this work before us and we join them in order to keep advancing this work as we address the racist and very subtle past of science and STEM education. 
Throughout our time together today, you'll hear me use terms like minoritized learners rather than minority students. And that's just to draw attention to the power dynamics um, that are inherent, right? We don't say minority students because we know that populations are minoritized. And I also use learners rather than students in most cases to remind us that children are always learning no matter where they are, whether that's in schools, out of schools, at home, in their communities. I know many of you who are there today are in the learning sciences. And so my work um, is grounded in sociocultural theories of learning. And so I don't view learning as the same thing as achievement. In my work, I draw upon what Naila Nasir and Vicki Han wrote about many years ago related to learning, where they view learning as conceptual knowledge development, identity development, who young people are and are becoming and the kinds of opportunities we um, provide in classrooms and other learning environments for them to become. And also we have to include some distal measures of performance like GPA and tests and things like that. That's what I consider learning when I'm thinking about teaching and learning. So if you read the description for the talk, you know that um, I'm all about uplifting <laughs> and making sure that we're clear about the ways in which um, STEM learning environments are racialized. We know that this is an effect of um, systemic racism. Um, and in our other work um, that builds upon the work of other scholars in the field, um, we've worked on a metasynthesis that really looks at how to characterize racialized learning environments with, an, with attention to mathematics. And what we found is that there's a pervasiveness of deficit narratives and that simply means viewing minoritized learners and their families and communities as deficient or less competent than learners who identify as white. Those implicit and explicit narratives are palpable in classrooms. Um, in an upcoming paper, we talk very um, we talk about this and what that can look like for children. Um, but we should know that. Um, their lived experiences are also devalued in learning environments and that many times students will um, learners will come into those spaces and not feel welcome. And so we're trying to push back against those ideas and those um, racialized learning environments as we seek justice and equity. So I'm just checking time. We're doing good at 26 minutes. So as we start to think about what the work of equity can look like, right, to push back against those kind of learning environments, um, I like to draw upon um, a recent National Academies report um, entitled Science and Engineering in Preschool Through the Elementary Grades, The Brilliance of Children and the Strengths of Educators. And they talk about equity in four different ways. The first is the one that most folks are probably familiar with, which is around increasing learning opportunities and access. But we also wanna move and start to think about the kinds of opportunities that children have for achievement, the ways in which they're represented or not in the curriculum and in the classroom and in STEM disciplines more broadly and the opportunities they have for identification with STEM and with STEM identities. We also wanna think about expansive views of STEM and science learning in particular, Megan Bang talks about this quite a bit. Um, if How many of you, did anybody go to NARST this past spring? Yes, no, maybe so. I can't really see, but if you did, you might've been there for her keynote address where she talks um, about this and thinking about the importance of centering indigenous knowledge and ways of knowing and being. And so thinking about what those expansive views can look like is really important as we think about what equity focused work can look like. And then finally, pursuing justice. Um, and that's really where my work is centered is around ideas of justice. Um, and I just remind us that we can only think about justice in terms of what it means to the communities that we're a part of and that we're serving. We can't make any um, assumptions about what justice means for them. And so when you're starting to engage in this work, you need to be really focused on what the communities want and what the children that you're working with the adults that you're working with say is important to them as we seek justice. We know there are many benefits based on prior and current research um, related to using equity-focused teaching practices. You can see a few of those here. 
What I really like to focus on is how we try to get teachers, though, pr primarily pre-service teachers, to do this work. And so I'll spend the rest of the time really going through um, our most recent paper, which was the impetus for this talk invitation. But first, I just want to stop and check in to see if there are any burning questions that I can answer right now, either in the chat or in person. Feel free to just unmute or call out. Well, I'm proud of myself for using my wait time. So that was good. Um, so feel free if you do have questions along the way to, to, um, to stop me and to interject, that's totally fine. Okay. So um, Dr. Christina Restrepo Nazar and I published a piece um, earlier this summer. Um, and you'll see that here, you'll see the title of that. Um, this work comes from um, the Science Education Campaign for Research on Equity Teaching. Um, the acronym is SECRET. If you know John Setlich at all, you know he loves his acronyms. And so he came up with our SECRET conference. It's an NSF-funded conference project led by Drs. Brian Williams, who's at Georgia State University, and Dr. John Setlich, who's at the University of Connecticut. I'll share later um, a few links for those of you that might be interested in that project. We're also hosting a convening um, about a month from now in, in mid-October to continue this work. But just to give you a little bit of perspective about the work, um, this project focuses on issues of equity related to theory building, mentoring, publishing, advising, what research um, partnerships can look like, and also what equity-focused instructional practices can look like. All of this work was published in a recent special issue of the journal Science Education, which is now available online, and many of the articles in the special issue, um, some folks paid for them to um, for open access, so please share them with your networks. Hopefully, I'm pretty sure the library there at Rutgers has access to this journal, but I invite you to take a look um, at, at this collection of articles. We're really proud of this work. Um, Christine and I were a part of the theory group. And so um, part of our work in that area was wanting to emphasize the importance of grounding our work in STEM education and science teacher education in theoretical frameworks, particularly those that take up critical perspectives that address, again, what many scholars call the racist and settled past of science and STEM education. And by that we simply mean thinking about the ways in which um, racism, um, has permeated science disciplines and scientific thinking, but also who has access to high quality, what we consider, what we might consider high quality science and STEM education, and what those um, experiences are like for young people who are taking those courses, what opportunities they have um, to see themselves represented, the kinds of understandings they're developing, et cetera. Any questions so far? I see a few things in the chat. Here. Oh, thank you, Amy. Okay, perfect. Okay, so what I'd like to do now is spend a little bit of time walking you through kind of the thinking um, that went into developing this paper. Um, and then I'll talk about some of the theoretical perspectives that we draw upon that we think are really important as we start to think about developing anti-racist teaching dispositions and implementing teaching practices in service of that. I think that's really important, particularly for those of us who are junior scholars, for graduate students to think about what's important to you and how you, what you bring to the work that you want to share with the world. And so I just want to walk you through a little bit of that before I share more about the paper. So first in our work as teacher education researchers and our training, both as learning scientists, um, Christine and I were both really um, thinking about our unique researcher positionalities as women scholars of color, as a black woman, she identifies as Latina, and how our positionalities shape how we view issues in science teacher education and teacher education research more broadly, but also what our experiences were like. Christina and I had very similar yet different experiences and we teach in very, um, very different contexts, but have a lot of the same issues. Um, she primarily teaches in a program um, that focuses on secondary 
um, STEM education and are, is preparing teachers um, who in many cases are coming directly from STEM fields and have been working in STEM as STEM professionals. And so getting them to kind of see the importance of this work can be really difficult because they've been inculcated into a culture, right, where thinking about issues of equity and justice is not necessarily the norm. So getting them to think that way as teachers um, is really important and to unlearn some of the things that they may have learned previously. In my particular context, um, I'm working primarily with pre-service teachers, but at the undergraduate level, so they're often young and still developing who they are as adults and coming into their full selves and also grappling with lots of issues, particularly here in Texas that they meet um, that other people may not be um, encountering. And so we wanted to ensure that our onto epistemological stances were central to how we approach developing these ideas and the considerations that we want to share. Um, and I'm just going to read a little bit from the paper um, just to give you a sense of our thinking, particularly for the learning sciences folks in the room. So from our onto epistemological positions, we assume multiple ways of knowing and being are always grounded in learners' cultural practices, which contribute to, to the co-construction of science knowledge. In our continued becoming as science teacher educators, we, the authors, believe the epistemologies of science and that of learners, pre-service teachers, and teacher educators are constantly in dialogue. As other critical scholars have pointed out for some time, we view learners' ideas and ways of knowing as resources for learning that both learners and teachers can draw upon in science classrooms. And there we're citing some work from Megan Bang and her colleagues, from Nayla Nasir and colleagues, and from Beth Warren and colleagues. And what I want to lift up here is just the idea that we really focus on asset-based perspectives and really thinking about the strengths that children their families and their communities bring to the science classroom. Any questions so far? Okay. Are y'all awake in there? Y'all good? Hopefully I'm not boring y'all. Okay, we'll keep going. We were also really concerned with how we might push back against anti-Blackness and other forms of systemic oppression that learners and their families experience, both in classroom and in their local communities. We were also concerned with how minoritized teachers experience pre-service teacher education, although those concerns that we had around um, teachers of color in particular, um, we weren't able to fully address in the paper, but we wanted to be mindful of that too. Um, as folks who were often the only in our program, we were often asked to be the racial representative. And so we wanted to be mindful of that as we start to think about the work. Um, and, and so that's something that's not necessarily highlighted in the paper, but I wanted to bring that to the attention of folks here in the room as you think about the work that you're doing either with pre-service teachers or even um, in your work with graduate students that we don't, um, that we don't foster those kinds of situations where folks who are, for, which for me, when I was becoming a teacher, I was the only black woman in my program. And so there were many, many unfortunate times that I was asked to be the representative of my race. And when I tried to resist that role, I was, um, there were consequences for that. And so we don't want to, to foster those kinds of learning environments. Um, and so we just wanna be mindful of those kinds of things as we push back um, against forms of oppression in doing this work. All right, we are also wanted to address um, the ways in which we can support pre-service teachers in developing equity-focused teaching dispositions and in using instructional practice that center justice. Again, the idea of moving away from issues of access and achievement and centering justice. And so what I'll share with you really briefly is just a few of those frameworks that we're drawing upon the most important of which um, we see is political clarity. Um, and if I could just get a sense from folks who's heard of political clarity or is familiar with this concept, this framework. Yes, no, maybe so. Okay, most folks are saying that they're unfamiliar with it. And thank you, Danielle. I'm glad you're enjoying the talk. 
Nice to get some feedback. Um, well, I'll talk a little bit more about this concept. Um, political clarity is one's understanding of the socio-historical, economical, and socio-political factors that can shape minoritized learners and their families, communities, material realities, and lived experiences, as well as how systemic racism can influence educational opportunities for minoritized learners. So if we were to take an example from today, right, from our current times, I live in a state where there's an anti-CRT law, right? Political clarity means that I understand that one, CRT is not a framework that is taught in kindergarten, first grade, right? It's not taught in K-12 spaces, right? That's primarily a graduate level framework that we're talking about. But attacking CRT, right, and other um, critical perspectives is grounded in white supremacy and understanding the ways in which that's carried out. And so this is what it looks like for folks to push back against this work and to actually put into effect laws that make it illegal, for example, to talk about the true history of enslavement in the state of Texas and in the US and beyond. So understanding what that means and the different ways that it can take shape in both schools and in communities is what political clarity is. And so it takes time to develop that, right? To be able to unpack what's actually happening in real time and to make sense of it and to understand why those um, issues are important to communities, but also how to address them, right? How to educate people to understand them and then to affect change. Any questions there? Okay. So a teacher who evidences political clarity, right? So we want our pre-service teachers and other stakeholders and service teachers policymakers, et cetera. We want everyone to, to evidence political clarity. And so doing so would mean that you have would mean that you have deep understandings of the kinds of injustices minoritized communities experience and the issues that are relevant to local, national, and global communities. It would also mean that you have deep understandings of the socio-political nature and landscape of schooling and society and the important role that teachers and other stakeholders play as advocates in the lives of minoritized children, especially um, and their families, how you help them, how you support them in the classroom, in your school community and beyond. And so um, thinking about one, not only helping them to understand what systemic racism looks like, the myriad forms that it can take, but also how to address it, how to push back against that and become change agents. And in a moment, I'm gonna talk more about what that actually looks like in some of the courses that I teach to give you some concrete examples. For now, I'm just gonna add one more slide where we're gonna talk through some of the other frameworks that we draw upon. Um, we also talk about teaching dispositions and practices in the paper. Several scholars have been talking about teaching dispositions for you know, decades, right? So this is not something that's new. Teaching dispositions are one's attitudes, beliefs, and observable behaviors. Um, and so we really think it's important um, for folks to, to, to really confront their beliefs and to understand how they think and feel about teaching, but also about the communities that they serve and the ones that they don't serve as well. Um, it's also their attitudes, the ways that they feel about teaching generally, but also teaching particular subject areas like science, what it means um, to teach elementary science, for example, to third graders. Is that something that people think is important? Do they have a positive attitude towards that? And then what are their observable behaviors? What do we see them doing on a day-to-day -day basis and a moment-to-moment -moment basis, both with children and young people in their classrooms, but also how they interact with families, how they engage the local school community. Um, and so we know that dispositions alone are not enough, that teachers must also know how to engage justice-oriented teaching practices. So they need to know what to do once they develop that disposition, right? They have some political clarity. They're figuring out how to bring that to bear into their teaching, into their planning, um, into their um, implementation of lessons, how they organize the classroom, and also how they actually do that moment to moment, day to day, 
in terms of their teaching practices. So we have to make sure that we're supporting pre-service teachers and in-service teachers as well in making connections between the mindset or the disposition and the practices, what we want them actually doing in order um, to pursue justice. And I have some work that I can share um, later if we have time related to a new study that we're working on where we're investigating teacher beliefs. Um, in the teacher education research literature, we've been talking about beliefs for gosh, 30, 40, 50 years, right? But in STEM teacher education in particular, we do not do a good job of actually investigating teachers' beliefs. And so my colleague, Yasmin Irizarry, who's in the Department of African American Studies here at UT Austin, um, our research team has developed the first national large scale survey that actually examines um, secondary mathematics teachers racialized beliefs. So we're actually asking questions related to lots of, um, of the ideas that I'm talking about now. And I'm happy to share more about some of our preliminary findings later if we have time. Okay, great, thank you. Getting some feedback. Um, I can also stop to answer any questions right now. Oops, have them. Okay, I'll keep going then. So based on my own research, I have some key takeaways from research and practice. Um, we know that we need to find ways to disrupt systemic forms of racism and find solutions for the ways in which it can influence learning for young children. Um, I like to think about young children, so this in the pre-K through five space especially, because we oftentimes don't think these issues are important for them, but they really are. So I'm thinking what we need to know for elementary pre-service teacher education, that's the space that I primarily work in. Um, some research that we've been working on really underscores a few um, points that I think are relevant to um, the, the the conceptual paper that Christine and I published. And one is that pre-service teachers need intentional and interconnected experiences, both within and across courses. Pre-service teachers need learning experiences with an explicit hyper-focus on equity-focused STEM teaching and learning, as well as continued conversations. And what I mean by that is simply that we need to have threads that are occurring across the semester and across different courses, right? So there are some conversations that we need to help them to make connections across, but we also need some really intense experiences um, where we hyper-focus on a particular issue or teaching practice. So for example, in my course, we start the semester by thinking about culturally relevant science teaching from the very first day. And so I give them an intense experience that um, they're going through as a learner which models something that I'd like for them to do in their own classrooms. And so that's a hyper-focused, intense experience. And we need those because they rely on those as they start to go into their own classrooms and plan and work with children. But we also need to make sure that we're connecting conversations across the, um, across the course itself and across other courses. Sorry, pardon me for just a moment. Another thing we've learned is that you must ground teacher education courses in important theories of learning and in critical theoretical perspectives and point that out to pre-service teachers. They are smart enough to figure it out. <laughs> They're smart enough to be learning it and we have to call, it, call a thing a thing. So for example, um, two weeks ago, we were reading a great piece by Beth Warren and colleagues um, and we talked about sociocultural theories of learning, and I reminded them continually that this is what we're focused on, so that they understand how their work is also grounded in theory. And then finally, um, if you've ever heard me give a talk, you know I always say this, part of this work cannot happen unless we first acknowledge, confront, and reject deficit thinking about minoritized children, families, and communities. And so we actually have to do the due diligence of investigating what those beliefs, what those kinds of thoughts are. Um, I'm happy to share some resources that I use in my own coursework um, with our student teachers, just different scales and surveys that we give them um, to just assess where they are and what kinds of things they're thinking, and then bringing those to bear week by week in, in teaching the course. 
And so I'll just end because I was asked to save about 15 to 20 minutes for Q&A. And hopefully you have some questions. So um, I'll end with the considerations and reflections that Christina and I offer in the paper. And they're just things that we, you know, I don't like to be prescriptive, but I like to give considerations, things that you should be reflecting on to really improve your research and your practice. And so the first one is how can you as a scholar, as a teacher educator, support pre-service teachers and others political clarity development? What kinds of things are you doing in your courses to really support that? Um, again, I'm happy to share more in the Q&A around some of those intense experiences and some that are less intense. I don't use intense in the sense that like it's earth shattering. I just mean that we're really hyper-focused on that in a particular week. Next, in what ways do you employ strengths-based perspectives or not? So how are the activities and the ways that you carry out both your research and your practice reflective of the idea that you believe that minoritized children and their families and communities have resources that we can use for learning, that they, that they bring strengths to the classroom and other places. This is what people often find the most difficult. How can we explicit, explicitly connect social justice issues to national or local science standards? So how are we connecting what we're teaching with social justice issues? And for those of you that are teaching courses, how do your course readings and materials prioritize justice-centered teaching? In what ways are you using the work of scholars of color or other marginalized communities? In what ways do those readings work both individually and collectively to really promote the idea of justice and really center equity? And then finally, how will you be mindful of fostering a brave learning environment? I'm not one who believes in safe learning environments because as a black woman living in the US, particularly living in the South, there are a lot of spaces that I actually never feel safe in where I'm learning, where I never feel safe to bring my full self. But what I can do is find ways to be brave and to support others in being brave. And so I just encourage you to think about the ways that you're mindful of fostering a brave learning envi environment for folks. And to connect back to what I was talking about earlier about thinking about minoritized pre-service teachers in particular and really trying to avoid those narratives where folks have to be the representative of their racial or ethnic or even gender, insert any identity, where we're asking folks either intentionally or unintentionally be the representative, how that is not um, indicative of fostering a brave learning environment. For folks. So those are just a few things that we, um, we ask in the article. And now I'm going to ask you to do some work. I'm going to do a stop and talk. Before we open up the Q&A, I'd just like for you all to do some initial thinking um, around what it might mean to re conduct research in this particular area. How many of you are graduate students? Okay, so if you are thinking about developing a research project in this area, thinking about perhaps studying or investigating um, how we can support pre-service teachers in developing anti-racist or justice-oriented, whatever you wanna call it, right? Fill in the blank. If you are doing some research in this area, oh, look at that, right on time. What are some potential research questions that could guide your work? And what are some potential research designs that could support these investigations? So I'll give you two minutes right now to think and then start to share with maybe an elbow partner, someone who's right um, near you and start to answer these questions. What are some research questions you might pose? What are some potential research designs that you think might work? Hey, Dr. Matkins, I can also set up a breakout room for anybody in the virtual if you want to uh, chat in a breakout room. Uh, I'll open that up um, just as an option. Perfect. Thank you so much, Amy.
Okay, that was two minutes to stop and talk with a neighbor. I'd love to hear some of your ideas if you're comfortable sharing them with the whole group around potential research design. And I'm already starting to see a few questions in the chat that we'll get to in just a moment. Yes, absolutely. Any ideas that folks want to share around just conducting research in this area? What kinds of data you might need to collect? The kinds of methods that you might employ? Research questions that might guide your thinking and doing? Looks like Danielle is going to unmute. Yeah. Great. You should be able to hear us now? Yes. Okay, that's right. Anyone want to share? Yeah, hi, Dr. Madigan. I follow you on Twitter. My name is Brittany Marshall. Hi, nice yes. to meet you. <laughs> um, so I was wondering, uh, well, one thing I would be interested in is like what um, teacher education programs are already con um, like incorporating justice oriented or equity oriented um, uh, education into their uh, programs. And so I was thinking of kind of like some survey data, which I know isn't really critical. We don't usually do quant work in critical research, but I thought that would be interesting. And also just uh, doing like a uh, survey slash questionnaires on specifically what teacher uh, pre service teachers are learning and if they feel like they're getting any of it. Um, another question I have for you, which is a little bit separate from this, is I was wondering, being a, a teacher educator in Texas, um, are you getting pushback at all in any of like the, the classes you teach? Because I think it's a very interesting time right now. Um, and you spoke about being like a black woman and feeling uh, discomfort or, you know, not really safe in a lot of spaces. And sometimes I don't feel that safe in classes that I teach here um, because I talk about race in my class, even though it's a math methods course. And I think people don't always expect that, but we're gonna get into it. But even with that being said, like I know this is the work I'm gonna do. However, it kind of leaves me kind of open in a way. So, Absolutely. yeah. <clears throat> Pardon me, thank you. And you said your name is Brittany? Yeah. Nice to meet you virtually. Hopefully one day we can meet in person. Um, to your first point, definitely, I think using surveys is actually a really powerful tool. Um, it's something that we're doing, like I mentioned a few moments ago, we've developed the first large scale survey that really investigates these kinds of beliefs. And we find that people are more honest when it's a survey because they don't, they're not talking directly to a person. So it's something for you to consider. For those of you that are graduate students and thinking about research that you might be working on with an advisor or moving into your own dissertation research, um, think about the kinds of things that are going to allow you space and time for people to truly be honest with themselves and with you, right? So the ways that you collect data actually really matter. Um, to your second point, I think Dr. Strong is also who you all are so fortunate to have as a new faculty member um, in your GSC. Um, has asked a similar question just around the kind of pushback um, and risks of doing this work, but also what it means to be doing this work um, as a woman of color, particularly for me as a black woman and for Brittany as well. Um, you're going to get a lot of pushback um, and there's, you know, there's research evidence to um, around the kind of things that happen with course evaluations, for example, right, we know that people who focus on these kinds of issues in their courses, um, their students tend to rate them lower at the undergraduate and even graduate level because they don't like being, some people don't like being pushed in this way, right? And so those are risks that we take in doing this work. Um, I try to make sure that I foster a space where people understand from the very first day that we are going to engage in these and that people need to be brave in doing that work and that we won't, um, we won't shy away from things that make us uncomfortable, actually. Um, and I heard someone say the other day, is it because I'm uncomfortable? Um, Dr. Shamari Reed gave a great talk here at UT on Friday, and he said, is it because you're uncomfortable with what's going on and it's pushing you and that's why you're shutting down? Or is it that the experience itself is actually causing you harm? And in many cases, I would argue it's more the, the first situation, right? People are discomfort and they may start to break down or um, to disengage. And so we have to be mindful of the places 
um, in our lesson plans where that might happen and to try to find remedies for that. Um, there's some good texts that I can send um, when I send a link to Amy and Dr. Duncan. I have a few resources of books that might be helpful for kind of facilitating those conversations. Thank you. Of course. Um, someone else asked about just what it's like doing that work here in Texas. Um, it's been, our teachers are definitely scared, but we're trying to also remind them if this is the way that you learn to teach, you'll do that, that these things pass, right? Um, and in particular, the laws here are really around social studies. And so um, the Social Studies Professional Teachers Association, whatever it's called, they've made actually a document of what you're allowed to do and the things that you can't explicitly say and do, um, which is sad, but also is really helpful for people to know what the cut points are. Um, there are a couple of questions here in the chat. Is it okay if I address those first and then come back to the lecture hall? Yeah, that would be great. Okay. Um, someone asked if I could give an example of engaging in justice-oriented teaching practices. That just means you're centering, thinking about issues of equity and justice, right? You're bringing those social justice issues into your teaching. You're being mindful of the strengths that students bring. And so if, if I were to do that in a lesson, um, I would be trying to think about the ways that I can make that learning culturally relevant for them, the ways that I can um, connect the content or the concepts that we're discussing um, to social justice issues. One way that I do that, and this gets at another question around the intents and experiences, I do um, a lesson, I call it the diaper donations or diaper desert lesson. Um, and it really helps them to think about engaging in science practices. It also helps them to think about um, issues related to the financial cost and the burden that it can be on families to actually have a baby and to have to just buy diapers, what that means in terms of where people live and where they purchase diapers, how much they cost, different cultural practices related to diapering itself, who uses disposable, who doesn't, who, do, who do, there are some folks who don't even put diapers on a baby at all. And so um, it also helps them to think about some of their own biases and their own experiences and how those might be different or similar to the children that they're working with. And so we do that lesson over um, about two class sessions where they experience that as a learner and then we unpack the practices for them. Um, a question from the audience in the lecture hall, if you have it. If not, there are a few more in the chat. Um, so I, you might have been talking about this activity just now. I'd love to hear you know, a lot more concrete detail about that immersive activity that you described uh, as the first thing you do with the pre-service teachers to really give them the experience of what this kind of teaching looks like. Sorry, I couldn't quite hear you. Was the, was the ask to just share more about what it actually looks like in the classroom. I more about the, I really love to hear more about the, the activities and what you do and you know how it's set up. Uh, that would help, I think, give oh. a feeling both for your instruction, but also what kinds of things you want the students to learn. Sure. So we start by, um, there's a reading that we do um, that's related to culturally relevant teaching and learning. And so we, to make sure they, <laughs> gotten what I want them to get from the reading. We talk about um, some of the key points from that reading and what um, culturally relevant science teaching could actually look like, particularly in the elementary classroom. And then they're in small groups, they're working. I give them some context um, around why we're doing this. Um, and that's just that an organization is gonna donate diapers to families in our school community, but we need to pick which diaper is the most absorbent that we think would be best for families to use. And so we have three different um, disposable diapers that we use, popular name brands. One's like an eco-friendly one. And we go through that um, where they're testing out. And so I tell them they can test in any way that they want, as long as they can tell me how their group is defining absorbency. And so in that part of the lesson, they're really engaged in science practices. And when we unpack that, I walk them through the different kinds of science practices the eight, you know, the eight science practices from NGSS that they might have been engaging in. We have conversations along the way about 
how often you might change a baby's diaper, how many times a day do you think you need to do that? And what do you think the anticipated cost, anticipated cost of that would be? Um, they decide, we make some data charts, and then we move into a discussion that's prompted by a video that I show them about what it means, um, the, the, the cost, but also what it might mean to live in a diaper desert, which is similar to a food desert, right? And so thinking about um, even our conversation the other week, we talked about redlining and how Austin in particular is divided by a freeway and that was done on purpose. And so who has access to grocery stores or not? All of those kinds of conversations come up in our, uh, um, those topics come up in our discussion, which really gets them thinking about issues of justice and what the communities that they're working with or grappling with. And when I unpack it, I show them, I model for them my thinking about how I made connections because there's a lot of chemistry content there, but how the kind of thinking I did to prepare that lesson to make it really rich and have all of the different pieces connect. I know we're almost at time. Yeah, Dr. Duncan, I know we're almost at time. I'm not sure if you have announcements that you need to make. I do not, but I want to make sure that if people have other questions, I want to make sure we get all the questions. And I have a question. Yeah. I'm curious to know, hi, Dr. Mack is also following you on Twitter. <laughs> I'm curious to know um, what some of your preliminary findings were for the study that you are planning with the African American students. Yeah, um, in that work, we um, piloted the survey um, with about 300 teachers. Um, and that sample mirrors what the national sample of teachers looks like. So it's mostly white women who are teaching um, um, in urban and suburban areas across the US. Um, and what we found, we asked both implicitly and explicitly um, questions that deal with teachers racialized beliefs, but also like um, we ask a question about, for example, um, if African American students at your school site were performing um, below average or well below average on achievement tests, what are some reasons for that? And we list intellectual ability, cultural values, homes, their families, um, other things like that. Um, and what we're finding across those kinds of questions, particularly the ones where we ask more implicitly, over half of the teachers, in some cases 70% or more, are endorsing deficit narratives about uh, minoritized children and their families. Um, the good news is that many of them are also telling us about the kinds of inclusive teaching practices they use. Um, but what we found is that they're doing that, but not frequently. They're doing it um, one to three times a month or less. And we feel like they should be doing that at least once a week, if not multiple days a week. Happy to share more offline too. Thank you. Of course. Any other questions? Um, no questions online, right? I just have a couple of questions online, but I'm not sure which one has been addressed. Um, so Olivia, you have got a question. Do you want to speak to that? Um, sure, should I unmute? Or no, 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 don't or unmute from you, just speak up. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, thank you so much for this talk. It was really great to hear about your work. Um, we were talking when we had a little breakout group a little bit about curriculums and kind of like how we can reshape curriculums um, to decenter whiteness. Um, and I really liked some of the examples you were giving about how, you know, when you teach the science curriculum, you can kind of um, link it back to issues of social justice. So that was, um, makes a lot of sense. But yeah, just was curious to hear more about that. Um, yeah, it's an intentional practice. Um, I think part of it is coming right from having political clarity and understanding um, ideas that may be presented in the curriculum um, as there's a lot of generalizations that happen. Um, sometimes we're seeing racist ideas. I know in some cases we're seeing, I've encountered even students here at the university who, who still believe that race is a biological construct rather than a, um, a social construct. And so helping them to unlearn that. But um, I guess what's central to that, the quick and easy is having an eye with attention to those kinds of things and figuring out what to take out of a curriculum 
um, and what to replace it with. Um, that's, I guess, my quick and dirty on that one for the sake of time. You know, we're at 12.01. Thank you so much. This has been really tremendous. We appreciate it. I think I'm actually sure that most people here would just love to hear more, honestly, uh, in terms of, you know, more uh, examples. And, and, I, and I think that uh, reading your work will really help with that. So I highly recommend folks read the articles that you shared in uh, some of those beginning slides. Um, to learn more and and follow. I also uh, follow on Twitter. So you can throw in your Twitter handle and get even more folks. Uh, it's been uh, really great. Um, so thank you so much. We truly appreciate it. Um, let's give Dr. Man um, Methods a huge uh, round of applause. Thank y'all so much for having me and for creating the space for all of us to keep learning. Thank y'all so much. Thank you. And um, and I think we have uh, we have the email also. We can if, if anyone's interested in following up conversations that we can provide, and I'm sure uh, that you can follow up. I did want to say that next week we have Jose Melendez uh, coming in, uh, also virtual uh, from uh, Oregon. And uh, so please do chime in next week. We'll also have pizza again uh, and another wonderful talk continuing with the Brown Bag series. So thank you everyone for coming. Thank you again, Dr. Matkins, really appreciate it. Um, and I hope that we'll run into you in some conference very soon. <laughs> you all have a great afternoon. Thank, thank you. you, you too.